Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Mark Lynn with Healthcare Business Specialist, and today's Lunch and Learn is going to be RHC 10 Care Quarterly Wrap Report Wrap Around Reporting. Uh, Danny Gilbert, who works with us, is going to be doing uh, that today. And there is my contact information. If you need to get a hold of me, please call, text, cell phones, send smoke signals. However, you want to get a hold of me, please try to. Here are the services that we provide. Uh, this is cost reporting time. So if we're preparing your Medicare cost report, please do get that information in. It's gonna be due by May 31st this year. We do not have an extra two months like we have in the past and they will cut your payments off. So uh, we haven't seen a lot of cost reports come our way so far. And I'm afraid everybody's sort of used to having an extra two months. You don't have that extra two months this year. So. If we, if we prepare your cost report, get those into us. If somebody else prepares your cost report, get that into them so that they can be doing uh, your cost report and you can get it filed timely. If you're not a member of the Facebook group, we have about 3,500 members in there and it's a great place to ask questions, to get information, to share resources with the Rural Health Clinic community. There's about 5,000 of you out there, so it's a very small number of RHCs in the country. There's a so so um, there's limited places for you to get information. This is one of the places that you can get information. If you do have questions, you can type those in, and I will ask Danny uh, the questions at the end of the session. Or with a small group that we're going to have with just our Tennessee clinics there, we can open up the line for you. If you just raise your hand, I'll open up the line, and you can ask the question as well. This is, this is a little different than the webinars where we have three or 400 people here. Uh, we're going to have, you know, 50 or 60 people here today, so it will not be as many as the normal ones. Uh, disclaimer, <clears throat> everything is current as of today. We'll be talking about Tennessee. So if you don't live in Tennessee and don't have to do a 10 care quarter report, this is the wrong place for you because we're just talking about Tennessee and we're just talking about how to do the 10 care quarterly report. This session is being uh, recorded as well for, and we will uh, put, this, put it on our YouTube channel for people to watch uh, later on. Uh, your slides, I did send those out about noon today. So we sent out a constant contact um, uh, um, newsletter. So you should have received that at noon today. If you didn't get that, uh, we do at our website at ruralhealthclinic.com, uh, RHC webinars. There is a place for it there where you can download those as well. So, so there they are. Uh, this webinar, uh, the last of our lunch and learns that we have scheduled is um, on Thursday. This is an important one. I don't think people really realize how important this is because 15% of all hypsis are going to be, uh, are going to go away on July 1st of this year. So people that are becoming RHCs or people that are currently RHCs depend on those hypsis. And uh, it's going to be a big change if that really does happen. Here's the American Hospital Association has written a letter uh, regarding the impact of this and trying to get a delay for this here. It says it represents a staggering 15% of all primary care hypsis are going to be going away effective July the 1st is the way that I read the, the proposed withdrawal. And that is going to be devastating for a lot of people. Uh, if you want to find out if your area is going to be with, withdrawn, here is the HRSA data warehouse where you can get a hold of it. If you come up here, you'll be able to click into this link and find uh, the areas that are that are the proposed for withdrawal. If you're in Tennessee, I've already run the report here. So if you get a hold of our slides and you click here, this is the Tennessee ones and it, it's eight pages long. So there's a lot of counties in that eight pages that are gonna be uh, withdrawn. What, what impact does it have on you? If you're already in RHC, you, it's not as big a deal, but you can't move. So if you're planning on building a, building a beautiful building across the street from you and move into it. If you lose that HIPSA status, if you're no longer currently underserved, then you can't move. You're, you're bound to where your address is. If you're becoming an RHC, and even though you've had your certification, even though, though you've had TCT or Quad A come out to do the certification or the state has done the certification, and you've not received your tie-in letter, the last step, that Medicare does in order for you to be an RHC is they look at your, they, they assign you a number 
and you have to be in a appropriate medically underserved area at that time or they will not let you be an RHC. It's very frustrating. It's happened to us twice where we've got to the very end, we've paid Quad A and the compliance team, they've paid us all their fees and the very last step, the area is no longer in a medically underserved area that's updated, it got withdrawn and they couldn't be an RHC. So no one was happy at that point. And there's really nothing uh, that you could do about it at that at that point. So so uh, look at those, be very careful. If you're planning on becoming an RHC, look at that, see if you're in an area to be withdrawn, see if you think you can get through the process in a timely manner. Joe's webinar, we'll talk a lot about this sort of thing. So Joe is the expert. I'm not, I'm definitely not the expert on hypsis, but you definitely want to attend that so you understand what's going to happen uh, in the future. So so that's all about that. That was my little quick mini uh, webinar on, on HIPSAS. Uh, about our speaker today is Danny Gilbert. Y'all know Danny. Danny does a fantastic job here. She is a partner uh, with Healthcare Business Specialist. Uh, she's been with us now for, I don't know, seven, eight years, was an intern with us back in the day. So Danny really has sort of absor absorbed pretty much everything that I know about RHCs and more. Uh, she is a certified public accountant. She is a certified rural health clinic professional. And she really knows a lot about these 10 care reports. She does about, I guess, probably 20, 25 of those for our clients. And I am going to turn it over to Danny uh, without further ado. So, Danny, you have control, and uh, I will sit back and listen for a while. Okay, can you see my slides, Mark? Um, let me see here. I can. Okay, perfect. Okay, hello everybody. Good afternoon. Um, as Mark said, my name is Danny Gilbert and I've been with Healthcare Business Specialist. Actually, it's only been a little over five years full time. I did, as Mark mentioned, um, intern off and on through college. So I, that's where you can get your seven to eight years. Um, I do help with RHC startups and program evaluations and work on preparing cost reports and 10 care quarterly wrap reports. Um, I currently have about 30 of our clients that I do the 10 care quarterly reporting for and a couple larger projects where we have some people who come to us that got a little behind on their reporting, so I do those. Um, I have a professional relationship with the Comptroller's Office Legislative Audit Manager, Maya Angelova, and I work closely with her and her team on our reviews of the quarterly reports for our clients. Um, with all that being said, I'm going to dig right into the presentation and the reason why you are all tuning in. <laughs> uh, I know the majority of you have probably been an RHC for quite a while, but I do want to quickly go over what to do once you become an RHC, as we do have a lot of clinics that are brand new to the program within the past couple of years. Um, once you pass the inspection, that's the date that you are certified as a rural health clinic. That's the date when you'll start getting your enhanced reimbursement rate from TenCare. You'll continue to bill the MCOs as you always have. If you bill Amerigroup, Blue Care, UHC, you'll receive the same payment as before you were certified. But where your additional reimbursement comes from is from the quarterly wrap reports that will be filed. You will not be able to start the reporting process until you receive the Medicare tie-in notice from CMS Atlanta Regional Office. The tie-in notice issues your provider number, which is also known as your CCN number. Some people know it as a PTAN number. Um, and this is the number that you will include on your report submissions along with your MPI number. <clears throat> After you get your tie-in notice, you will need to go within the TenCare portal and change your provider type to Rural Health Clinic. And I'll go over that information in just a moment because um, there are some steps that you have to follow. You'll also need to pull a CPT frequency report and put together a letter of acknowledgement of visit count accuracy addressed to Maya in order to receive your TenCare PPS rate. The re the rate is now set based on the average PPS rate for neighboring clinics with similar caseloads. And they usually go by the grand divisions of West, Middle, and East Tennessee. And then they'll look at your number of visits, whether you have like zero to 8,000, 8,000 to 14,000, 14,000 and above is how they kind of base your rates. Um, once all of that's been done, you'll file the first 10 care quarterly wrap report and send it to Maya and her team. 
Um, you should expect to receive the first settlement check in about six to eight weeks from the report submission. Um, and every subsequent quarter, I've seen them as quickly as four to six, but I think six to eight is probably your safe bet all around. Here's the website that you would go to in order to enroll with TenCare. Um, if you're an existing clinic that is already enrolled as a single or multi-specialty group, you will use your same login credentials that were previously set up. Once you log into the portal, you'll follow these instructions um, to change your provider type to rural health clinic. I'm not going to go over each of these steps with you because it it's kind of hard when you don't have the portal in front of you, but I did want to include the instructions on this slide for your reference. If you're going through that process, you can reference back to this. Um, if you're new to the program and are having issues with the instructions on the previous slide, um, here's the contact information for TenCare provider enrollment. You can give them a call. You can give them an email. I know they're usually pretty, pretty helpful um, and quick to respond to even if you go the email route. All right, now we're going to get into the part of the webinar that I know you've all been waiting for. I'm going to go over how the TenCare quarterly wrap report works and then go into details as far as counting the visits and the payments for the report. I'll also open up the spreadsheet and show you that process that I use that has made it easy to make sure that I capture everything and that it gets reported accurately when sending to the comptroller's office for settlement. To recap what I mentioned earlier, the MCOs will not change the rate that they pay you when you submit a claim to them. The way that you receive your enhanced rate from TenCare is by submitting the quarterly report to settle out the difference. At the bottom of this slide is a very simplified example um, to show you how the reporting works. Um, in this example, this clinic had a thousand visits that were paid in this quarter. Um, each visit, the MCO on, um, on the remit paid them $50, so they had a total payment from the MCO of $50,000 at the end of the quarter. Um, here's where your 10 care rate comes in. Your 10 care rate is $125 a visit, but your MCO is only paying $50. So your 10 care settlement, when you submit your quarterly report, will pay you the difference, which in this case would be $75,000. 10 care quarterly wrap reports are due the last day of the month following the close of the previous reporting period. You will notice in the above chart that TenCare uses the calendar year, uh, calendar year quarters as their reporting periods. Currently, TenCare does accept late filings, but that could potentially change at any time. So I highly recommend you get, getting your reports filed by the published due dates. Um, with that being said, I did want to make this note, as I know we have a lot of um, clients that have come to us recently who either A, were not aware that they had to do quarterly report, or B, they were just falling behind and afraid that they had missed the deadline and wouldn't get paid. Um, if you fall into either of these two categories, you can still file the late reports for a reimbursement. So get on those if you haven't already, because that's potentially free money just sitting there for you. All right, now we're gonna get into the details as far as counting the visits and the payments for the 10 care quarterly report. Um, you wanna count only those visits that were paid during the quarter that you're reporting on. If there's, a, excuse me, if there's a claim that is unpaid, your billing staff or billing company, if you use one, should be looking into those claims to see why they were unpaid, correcting them, and then resubmitting them. Um, once those claims are paid is when you would record them on your quarterly report. The way the report works is that the visits and claims that are paid in January through March, for example, will be reported on the first quarter wrap report. On the second quarter report, visits with a date of service during the first quarter and second quarter, but that were not paid until the second quarter will be reported. The first and second quarter visit totals will be on separate columns of the report. And this will make more sense once I open up the spreadsheet and you can see the report itself and how it's laid out. Here's an example of what the report will look like when you have visits paid in a certain quarter quarter two in our example, whose dates of service were in multiple quarters. In this example, the clinic has 418 visits with a date of service in Q1 and 513 visits with a date of service in Q2 that were paid in Q2. Therefore, the clinic reported a total of 931 visits 
on the quarter two wrap report for settlement. The bottom portion of the report does the exact same thing for payments as it does for visits occurring with dates of service quarter one and quarter two. So it's laid out the exact same way. They correspond with each other. 10 care visits are face-to-face -face encounters with the physician, physician assistant, nurse practitioner, certified nurse midwife, clinical psychologist, clinical social worker, or licensed professional counselor. Um, some common examples include office visits, nursing home visits, physicals, maternity, and behavioral health. Um, one thing to make sure you note is that what constitutes as a visit for 10 care does not always constitute an RHC Medicare visit and cannot be billed as such. Um, one example as far as the visits go are physicals. Um, and then if you look at your providers, um, 10 care allows visits performed by an LPC to be counted, whereas those are not a RHC visit for Medicare purposes. In most cases, 10 care will limit the number of visits that a clinic can claim to one visit per patient per day. Pediatrics will be allowed to count both a sick and well visit on the same day. And then another example is if you have a sick visit and a behavioral health visit on the same day, you can count two. If the patient was seen by two different providers for the sick visit and the behavioral health visit, and if the clinic included behavioral health in their initial scope of service. Um, if the clinic did not include behavioral health in their initial scope of service, you'll have to file and get approved for a scope of practice change with 10 care. And that's a little more meat that, that we don't wanna look into right now. If you have questions about that, feel free to reach out, but that's not common. Okay, here's an example of a remit um, that has two visits in one day. Uh, as you can see, this is a pediatric patient, which you can tell by the CPT code for the well visit. Therefore, you can count both the sick visit and the well visit for reimbursement. You will also count all the money received on this paid claim. Here's a statement that came from Julie Rogers. She's now the assistant director to the control, comptroller of the treasury regarding counting payments. Um, the biggest thing to note is that you want to include all monies received for services, including lab services, provided to 10 care enrollees. You also want to make sure you're counting the payments coming from third party payers and patient liability amounts. This would include deductibles, co-pays, things of that nature. Some reports that I've reviewed for clinics have omitted the co-pays because they may not have collected those from the patient. However, you must count those payments as it's your duty to collect those from the patient. Whether you do or not, it's kind of on you. It's not 10 cares responsibility to pay something that you were supposed to collect from the patient. When counting payments, you must include all payments for core services as well as ancillary services, even if there's no visit associated with the service. For example, labs, x-rays, et cetera. Um, there are also some fairly new exceptions to the statement that I'll cover towards the end of the session with some updates. Um, another thing, all payments must be included, including patient co-pays and payments from third-party insurance payers. <laughs> Here's an example where there would be no visit to count for reporting, but you must include the payment that you got for the vena puncture. So the 135 that you got from the MCO would have to be included on your quarterly report, even though there's no office visit associated with it. Here are a couple examples of claims that had third party payments that were received as well as the amount paid by the MCO. When counting the payments, you have to include both portions. So in the top, you would include the 5068 and the 537 for a total of 5605. The bottom, same applies with the two highlighted boxes for a total of 5253 that you have to claim. Another thing <clears throat> that I want to point out in this example is the payment from the MCO on the visit line itself. In the top claim, the MCO did not make payment on the visit line itself, which normally would disallow you from counting the visit, usually because that patient was the visit was denied. However, in this instance, the, this is not not a denial, but rather a zero payment because the third party payer was the one who paid the visit line. 
and then and you're including their payment in the reporting. I know that's kind of convoluted and I hope that makes I hope that makes sense. But the biggest thing is there's a difference between a denied claim and a zero payment claim. This table summarizes the most common items that clinics bill for and how to handle them on the quarterly report. Um, you'll notice that just about all payments should be included. Um, there are a few exceptions that are fairly new, again, that I'll cover towards the end of the presentation. If the visit line is denied, but the ancillary services are paid, you cannot count this as a visit, but you must count the payment received. This goes back to the previous slide example. There's a difference between a denial on the visit line and a zero dollar payment. I'm gonna go back to this just for a second. So in this example, say there was no third party payment, but the MCO still paid the 537. The visit would have been, that would mean the visit's denied. That means you cannot count this visit, but you do have to still count that $5.37 that you received from the MCO. Um, this is a great example of when your biller um, should go back and look at the reason why that visit line was denied. Um, hopefully you can correct the claim and rebill it. And then once that visit line is paid, you can count the visit itself and the payments associated with it. One common example of not counting a visit would be for Medicare crossover claims. Um, a Medicare crossover is when Medicare is primary and TenCare is secondary. Uh, this type of payer mix is completely excluded from the TenCare quarterly report. So you do not count the visit and you do not have to count the money that you received for the MCO for this visit. As far as completing the report, every TenCare remit should be sorted by MCO and then reviewed for visits and payments by quarter. On the Excel spreadsheet, there's an accumulation log in my template. There's an accumulation log tab that I created where you can summarize the EOB information. Um, it's got columns for the check number, the date, the number of visits by quarter and the payments amount. This, this also helps, I will say, when they're going to review your quarterly reports, I've had a lot of times when they're saying, hey, Danny, can you send me a copy of remit 123 um, so I can see where your counts have come from? And it kind of helps when they're pulling those for samples for review to make sure that they can see where your numbers are coming from. And I'll show you what that looks like here in a second. One thing that I can't stress enough is physically looking at the RAs instead of relying on strict solely on the billing company reports. Um, in the past, there have been multiple clinics that we have have come to us um, who relied solely on their billing company's reports and ended up owing TenCare tens of thousands of dollars for reporting errors um, that overstated visit counts or understated payments received. It's one thing to rely solely on a billing company and another if you have ensured that their process for pulling those reports work. So if you wanna rely on your billing company, I would do maybe one or two quarters manually going through them to compare what you get going through them to what your billing report is pulling to make sure that they're tying together before you submit anything. And here I'm going to switch my screen to the spreadsheet. Mark, can you see my spreadsheet? <laughs> Yes, Danny, I can see it. Okay, okay, good. I just wanted to make sure before I started talking. Um, mm -hmm. Here's an example of a report. This this was one that I did in the fourth quarter, um, and it shows all the information. As you'll see on this bottom line, this is what they pay on. They pay on the bottom line each quarter. So if this um, particular clinic had visits from quarter one, all the way back to quarter one, that weren't paid until quarter four. So you're gonna wanna break them out by column. In the front page, the columns represent the dates of service and your lines represent the dates that it was paid. And then this over here is just like a little summary that I do for our clients to see what they can expect each quarter. Um, it takes the total visits by their rate, subtracts out what they get from the MCOs and that way they can see when they get their letters from TenCare showing your total amount is X, they can compare it to what the report is and it should be within a couple dollars. Here's the accumulation logs that I was mentioning that I have added to my template to help with 
auditing and all of that because I'm a CPA by nature. Um, it has, I've taken out the check numbers, but for instance, this particular remit had visits from quarter one and quarter two that were paid. So I broke those out. Those all some I've got an Amerigroup section, a Blue Care section, and a United Healthcare section. Each one of these sums down at the bottom. And then this little summary up at the top combines the three MCOs. And this box right here is what pulls to here. That way you're never having to key into this face of the report because this is what gets it to 10 care. When I send my reports to 10 care, I also send them the six cell book so that they have all of this data as well um, so that they, they can pull whatever they need to help them review it and process the payment quicker. I am more than happy if there, if any of you would like a copy of this template or want me to tweak it to put in your, so all of this is going to be your historical data from previous reports. Um, if you need help setting it up, I'm more than happy to help you just shoot me an email. Let me get back to the PowerPoint. All right, now that we went over the 10 care PPS reporting, I wanted to briefly touch on cover kids. Um, make sure you're reporting your cover kids on a separate report for settlement. Back in July of 2017, 10 care announced changes in the way that cover kids patients would be processed. Historically, the provider didn't have to self-report these claims, but now that the comptroller's office has taken over, you do have to you are required to file quarterly reports for these as well. And it, the report is very similar. As you can see, it's very similar to the PPS. It just will end up getting emailed and um, submitted to a different email address. The last part of the presentation, I wanted to go over a few updates that TenCare has published over the past couple of years um, regarding TenCare reporting. In March 2020, TenCare announced approval to allow home as an originating site for telehealth purposes in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, note that this approval was only for the duration of COVID-19 emergency. However, the telehealth bill passed in August of 2021. So now RHEs are eligible to continue receiving PPS settlements for telehealth visits if the MCO pays the claim and all other, all other criteria are met such as an eligible enrollee, you've got an eligible service, eligible provider, et cetera. And all of that came directly from Maya this morning. I emailed to make sure. <laughs> um, in May 2021, TenCare announced that the revenue received for vaccine admin fees with the date of service on or after January 1st, 2021 should not be included in the PPS settlement reports. This is different than it was in the past. Before you had to count all of the vaccine admin fees, but in response to COVID and um, the increase, increasing availability of vaccines, they decided we're just gonna carve that out. You don't have to report those monies on the PPS settlement reports anymore. And I have copies of these memos if you need them. Um, this past December, TenCare announced that revenue received for Category 2 F codes with a date of service on or after October 1st, 2021 should not be included in the PPS settlement reports. There is an exception for pregnancy-related F codes that count as a visit, your 050123Fs. The revenue should still be included in the report because you are also counting those as a visit. This will not apply to the majority of you. <laughs> Um, in December 2021, TenCare also announced that visits which take place at a hospital with the date of service on or after January 1st, 2022, should not be included in the PPS settlement reports. Um, the memo does not apply to those services that must occur at a hospital, for example, maternity visits, global deliveries, sterilization, and or other surgical OBGYN services. Again, this probably does not apply to a lot of you but I wanted to include it because I know we've got a couple OB practices. Um, 
Ah, I know that was a lot to cover and I went fairly quickly. I tend to talk fast when I'm nervous, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. but I want to open it up to any questions that you may have. Um, also, if you would like a template created to fit your clinic's historical reporting data, that includes the accumulation logs that I have added to my template, feel free to reach out to me and I'm more than happy to send it to you. Okay, Danny, that was a fantastic job. Uh, this is Mark. I am going to read the questions that we have in the question box. And if you want to open your, if you want to raise your hand over here, I will open up your line for your question once we get through. I think we've got five or six questions. <clears throat> so let's go ahead. Um, first question from Sonia is We were advised that we couldn't change our specialty. Tim Care had to do that, and we had to fill out some updates to have them review and then update to the RHC. And that, I guess, I don't know if that's a question or a comment, or I don't know, Danny, what do, what do you know about that? Yeah, and that's right. If you go back to, there was, I think it was slide three, um, there are the different steps that I've talked about. I didn't go into detail on them, but I put them in the slide, because um, you will have to like upload your CMS tie and notice, and then you let them know that it's up there, and then they'll change the type, and then they'll ask you, you'll go back and forth, and all of that, like I said, I put the parts that I know on the slide, um, but if, if you have any questions, I would reach out to them directly. That You are correct, Sonia, that it, you do not change it yourself, but it, it is back and forth with you for them to change it on their end. Okay. Uh, Louise has a question about behavior. It says, behavioral health providers were added after we became an RHC. Do we count those? How do we know what our scope of practice said then? Okay, Louise, you're in a little bit different scenario just because I know your situation because you came in after the moratorium and they don't do base year cost reports anymore. I am still waiting on guidance. I I've been waiting for a couple of months and they told me that it's coming for the new clinics. Now, if you're an older clinic who your base, your rate was set because you filed a base year cost report, you'll go back and look at that cost report. And at that time, did you include expenses for behavioral health? Did you have behavioral health visits that base year? Um, so it's going to be different with, with whether you were before the moratorium or after. Yeah. And then, and, and Louise, for, for some of the ones that, I know we had some that were, that were some of the older ones that had a base rate set. And Tim Care came in and they were including behavioral health in there, even though it wasn't in their base year. Tim Care tried to come in and say, well, uh, we're, we're no low, we shouldn't have paid that. We want this money back. And then I went in and looked at the rules and looked at all the, the regulations that they published at the time. And none of it said that you had to have a you had to have a scope of practice change to do that. They were just telling people that. And that was about a year and a half or so ago. And they said, well, we'll get back to you on this because we can't find it either. And it's been a year and a half and we haven't heard heard back from them and they haven't asked for the money back either. So we'll, you know, we'll, we'll get an update here eventually, but but uh, but uh, that, that's something that's a very, it's, it's, I don't know, it's just, it's not, it, it wasn't very spelled out at all back then. And it's still, I don't think it's been settled yet, but, but going forward, that's the way you want to make sure that you do that. Okay, so next question. So adult preventive services and sick visits on the same day do not qualify to be counted. I, I guess they're, they're saying is you don't get two visits uh, for one, for a preventive service and for a, uh, a sick visit on the same day if they're adults. And that's the way I've always understood it was if the children, you can get two visits if they're adults, you don't. Is that, is that right, Danny? Yes, sir, that's correct. I usually, it's easier just for me just to look at the CPT codes because I think 384 and 394 end, it's age 17. So anything lower than that, you can make you can count on both. But if it's above that, you cannot count two visits on the same day. Okay, okay. and then Luis has another question here. Uh, Copay count questions, primary, uh, paid and allowed $25 copay. TenCare MCO uh, said no extra payment and we can't balance bill the $25, so it is a write off. So, do we count the $25 or not? The copay uh, money was not received. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say yes, just because that's my gut and I know how TenCare works. I can find out for sure for you though, Louise. 
One thing to look at though, because when you're looking at your remit, if the, if it shows that $25 copay in that call in that column on the uh, remit that says copay, <laughs> um, then more than likely they're going to make you count it. If it's not showing there, it may be up for interpretation. But again, I can find out for sure for you um, and let you know what they say. Okay. Um, is the vaccine admin code only for COVID vaccine or what about vaccine for children administration? It is for all vaccines. Oh. When they put out that memo, and I can send you a copy of that if you would like, um, but it is now for all vaccines. Okay. And then Brenda's saying we just added behavioral health as well. So please let us know as well uh, what, what, we, what we need to do. So, okay. So, okay. We'll do that. We'll do that, Brenda. Uh, let's see here. And Darla. Yes, Darla. I, just, I was wondering why Darla was staying under. She's from Georgia. And she's like, is this just for Tennessee clinics? I'm like, uh, yeah, you, you missed the first part where I told everybody this is just Tennessee. So, so. Darla, we will see you soon, honey. So, so sorry about that. Okay, Tennessee does not show uh, Tennessee does not show it as a copay, uh, though the primary did show it as as a copay. That's what that's Louise's question. Okay, there. okay. I would think Louise that then you wouldn't have to, but I can find out for sure because okay. I don't want to tell you wrong. <laughs> okay. All right, that's all of the questions that we have. Uh, let me see here, see if anybody's got their hands up if you want to talk to us. This is a good chance to do so. Um, before we leave, Danny, um, I know one thing that you do that's really neat when you when you do these is you go into what, avail, uh, what, what is it, Availity, and what's the other one that you go into? Yeah. So you can go into Availity. Um, the Availity portal is where you can pull Amerigroup and Blue Care Remittance Advices. And then UHC, I've seen some clinics that use Optum Health, and then some use like a UHC online. You can, depending on which way your clinic set up is where you can pull them from, but you can actually go and that's what I, like Mark said, that's what I do is I'll go in, I'll pull all of the remits from, so if I'm doing the first quarter, January 1st to March 31st. And then that way I know I've got every single thing that was paid because they're all right there. Um, and I actually print them all out um, and then I color code the dates of service. If, it, if the visit occurred in Q4, it's one color. If it occurred in Q1, it's another. And then that helps me when I'm going through and keying it onto the accumulation log. It is a lot of work. It's um, it's it's not hard. It's just, it is a lot of work. It's very detail oriented. But when the auditor, if you ever come, the auditors ever come in, I, I put it in an expandable folder every single quarter and you can say, okay, here's all of my reports, here's all of my supporting documentation, have at it. <laughs> so, but yes, Mark, you're correct. Avail mm -hmm. Like I said, availability is for Merit Group and Blue Care and either Optum or UHC Online is where you can pull your UHC remits. Yeah, I think I can't stress enough to to really double check. If you're trying to do it through a billing company, I know we've, we've seen people try to do through Athena before and it never, I, I've never seen it actually work. And so what I would do is do it manually for at least the first two quarters and see if you're getting very close to the same numbers because we've had the comptroller's office call us several times in the past saying, hey, people were doing this report this way and we don't think it's right. Can you go back in and do this report the way it should be? And then they've done audits and they've come up with you know hundreds of thousands of dollars of differences when you do it that way and also the medicare remember medicaid and medicaid crossovers do not go on this report i've seen several comptrollers of the treasury reports where they come in and do audits and they said such and such clinic did this and they were overpaid by three or four or five hundred thousand dollars because of that so so that is something that we've seen several clinics, not none of our clinics, but I've seen reports, audit reports that the Comptroller's Treasury Office releases that shows people that have done that. And it's, that, 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 that is not good. Let me tell you, that is not good. So. And one thing I had on my um, one of the slides that I didn't actually go into details on, but one that I was reviewing recently had this problem is nurse only visits. Those do not count um, because they were not done by an quote RHC provider. Um, 
the definition of an RHC provider. I know one that I reviewed just a few weeks ago, they had been counting 99211s for a while. And I was like, oh no, you never could have done that. <laughs> you were never supposed <laughs> to be doing that. So we had to go back and they, I mean, we, we cleaned it up, but that is one thing you want to make sure um, those nurse only visits do not count mm. either. Okay. All right. Well, Danny, thank you. You did a great job. It not, seemed nothing to be nervous about whatsoever. <laughs> and uh, thank you guys for attending. Uh, again, the session on Thursday will be will be great as far as the um, as far as the withdrawal of I can't, I can't what is the word I'm trying to look for the withdrawing of hipsas. That's stuff that you really need to know because especially if you're becoming a rural health clinic. Uh, that's gonna that really is gonna affect how fast you need to work to become an RHC if your area is gonna be withdrawn. Your designation is gonna be withdrawn in the near future. So so watch that. Uh, next week it's gonna be a slow week for us. Actually, be a busy week. We'll be at the National Association of Rural Health Clinics session in San Diego, San Antonio. If you not join the NARHC, please do that. Um, let me see here. Uh, we, we one last question here from Brenda. We were told we could use the same MPI number for our RHC and non-RHC. However, I am finding out that maybe we should change. Up to this point, we've counted remits, but all the payments for both clinics are on the same remit, which is very tedious. What are our options on this? Uh, you may need to call me. Uh, I've turned totally gray gaming, so <laughs> we're Brenda. <laughs> So do you have any, I know that that's been a big issue that's with Palmetto, with the weird stupid rule about having to have two MPI numbers that we don't think is really accurate. Uh, Danny, do you have any response to that? I do. We always, Brenda, when we're setting up especially new RHCs, we always make them get another MPI number for this reason. Um, because on your report for 10 care, you now have, not used to, you didn't have to, but you now have to list the MPI that you're billing under. And they will, compare those and I know Mark, Mark I can't remember it's maybe been a year or so ago you had sent me an audit report for mm -hmm. somebody who did this exact same th this exact thing and they had granted they weren't stressing like you Brenda they were just counting them all <laughs> they're not RHC and they're RHC but that's where you kind of run into a hiccup as if uh oh we accidentally counted some of these that are non RHC visits that could potentially get you in trouble and you're right it does create gray hairs <laughs> having to sort through all that when it would be so much easier if you had that second NPI number and we're billing it all under the same, like all under its own NPI number. Okay, so so get another NPI number and get it credentialed. That's probably the best way to, <laughs> to do that for your non-RHC stuff. So, okay, all right. Thank you, everybody. Y'all be, be good, be safe. Thank you.